Hi, everyone. It's Leanne West, and I'm president of the International Children's Advisory Network. I just want to welcome you today to Ask the Experts with Anthony Chang. So I am so glad that we have everybody today with us. Um, special thank you for Dr. Anthony Chang for coming in and joining us today. And we are also joined by Leanne West, the president of ICANN. Uh, so we are so happy to have her. And Claire DeStromp will be recording today's session. Uh, so we are so glad for all of your ideas as this continues to be something that inspires and helps everyone uh, as we go forward. So thank you for all joining us. Um, with that said, I'd love to turn it over to Leanne so she can introduce and get started today's topic. And we want to be able to hear from all of you. So just a couple ground rules. Um, make sure that you mute and unmute yourself as needed. Uh, please feel free to turn on your camera if that's something you're comfortable with so we can see you and, and just kind of know who's behind the screen. Um, if you don't want to, that's fine too. We also have a chat. So if you feel like that's better to write in the chat, feel free to do that as well. We will go back and refer to it often. Um, and all ideas are good ideas. So anything you share, we'd love to hear. And with that said, Leanne, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here at SC Experts this month. We're so excited. Um, you know, this is coming after our annual conference, which was so very fun. And some of you all got to be there, which is fabulous. Um, but I wanted to introduce Anthony Chang, who all of y'all, I think, have met before through Ask the Experts or the conference or some other means, because he's always here helping us. So we're so happy to have him today. And um, today we're going to be talking about ideas that you have, things that have happened to you that are positive, ideas you've had of things that um, helped you. And Amy, you can probably describe it better than I can. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, today's topic is really about how kids can help. And what we mean by that is we want to hear from you and all the things that you have done over the years that have been special in contributing to improving healthcare or clinical research or even at your local chapter level for your hospital. You can tell us things that you love to participate in, ideas that have really sparked that learning and understanding and betterment of your local area and your local community. Even if you didn't do it through ICANN, we still want to hear about it because sometimes those ideas are the things that really make ICANN better. We can take those ideas and do something really powerful and magical with them. So think about your stories and, and kind of collect your thoughts on what you might like to share. But all these ideas really are terrific ones and we're excited to hear from all of you. Um, and with that said, I'm going to send it over to Anthony, Dr. Chang, uh, to see if you'd like to share any insights from your end um, to get us started. What is um, what would you like me to focus on as the theme? Because that's kind of a broad topic. It is a really broad topic, and I think intentionally so because what maybe is something that really helped you as founding your groups like AI Med or um, the International Society of Pediatric Innovation might be inspiring for somebody to do something on a smaller scale, maybe okay. locally. Um, but I think those are great ideas of, you know, how you started something you saw a need and filled it and yeah. made a difference. Okay, great. Um, I'm kind of shy to talk about myself, but um, I think um, one thing that anyone can do on a small scale is to start a group that sort of can, gets everyone excited about something and E either um, some aspect of medicine or having young people have a voice like I can or have people focus on innovation. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, um, people sell themselves short and think, well, I'm just one person, I can't do this. But I think one person with, a, with a enthusiasm and passion to do something can get a lot of things done. Um, so I think one good example I can think of is uh, my nieces are um, <clears throat> all pretty much going to healthcare. Um, and one of them, when she was 13, uh, went on a trip to uh, Cambodia with my brother, who is a plastic surgeon doing a medical mission there. And not only does she get excited about helping people on that medical mission, 
but she realized that um, the girls in Cambodia were not getting education. And that turned out to be, and as um, we, um, we know, um, girls not getting education is a huge issue in a lot of societies and also um, really uh, becomes an issue with the economics of the country. Uh, because girls and women who are not educated is such a large um, lost opportunity for these countries. So she <clears throat> became really, really motivated to help with that. And um, between my brother and I, we, we suggested to her that she should um, look into the possibility of starting a non-for-profit organization to drive funds to help children uh, in uh, particularly girls in Cambodia. Uh, at the time, she thought it was, you know, I'm 13 years old, maybe know enough to know that this is not possible. <laughs> and um, so we didn't uh, really help her that much, but she just kind of um, looked into the process of starting a non-for-profit and setting up an, a, a bank account and everything. And before you know it, um, I was getting a notice around the holiday time because the tradition in our family um, around the holiday time is not to uh, be distracted with so many presents for all of us, but we donate to each other's favorite charities as a, as a gift. And um, I was getting a, so around holiday time that year, I was getting a, a, a notice from my niece that I should donate to her charity that she had founded um, out of nothing, you know, just over the summer, uh, she got it going. And then uh, sure enough, she had, and it still exists today, you know, about 10 years later. So I was so impressed that, um, uh, and when she was applying to medical school, she talked about her, her experience as a 13 year old starting a, a charity and a non-for-profit to help a cause. And the wonderful thing about um, this country and some countries around the world is that the, uh, the barrier to, to entry to do something like that is actually quite low. You can just literally start a company or a charity within a few days if you wanted to. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think that's a great example how uh, someone as young as 13 can easily do something on mostly on their own if they feel um, strong enough about a cause that, that they should try to make a contribution to. I love that. I think that's wonderful. So um, I want to just see something in the chat. Yes, it's definitely a very powerful story. I love that. Does anyone have any ideas of, I mean, even just like this story where she saw a need because of a trip that she took. I mean, does anyone have any ideas like that? You know, something that's inspired them that they've seen or done. Um, even if you haven't, started your own charity or anything like that yet, I can see that, you know, maybe people have had over time um, some experiences like that where they thought that's not really right. How could we change that? So I don't know if any of you all have had those kind of thoughts before. And don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Reese. So I did not start my own charity, which is, and I, um, I'm so excited for her and what ends up becoming for her as well. Um, but I was a part of a volunteer organization at the hospital and it was called the Teen Advisory Council. And it was a group of kids that were making the hospital more teen accessible and sharing their ideas and stuff like that. Well, I joined as soon as I could at 13 years old and I had the most amazing I think I was able to experience things that not a lot of other kids got the privilege to do. So I, I would say that was like one of my most positive experiences. And I think that shaped who I am today. I feel like there are a lot of things that I see differently now that I was a part of something so young. Um, and I also am so grateful for um, innovative healthcare. And I think that really showed me why we have like important and being a part of research is so important because it keeps kids healthy and that in turn allows them to make the hospital the most amazing place to be 
don't totally want to be there. So. I love that. That's wonderful. And I see Mary Rose put something in the chat. Um, Mary Rose, I, you know, I know you kind of spelled things out there, but I would love for you to talk a little bit about that and what inspired you to, to work with those families. Would you be willing to do that? Um, yeah, well, I drove through this town like all the time and you could just see homeless people across the street. And honestly, I really enjoyed doing lemonade stands with my friends because, you know, it was just a fun experience. So I thought that while we were making all this money, we could also contribute to help people because, you know, I didn't need the money. I wasn't like broke or anything. I had a job. So, you know, that's just what we did. I love it. I love it when lemonade stands turn into something more than just the kids trying to get money to go buy the next, you know, whatever video game or comic book or song on Apple. I don't know. Um, I remember there was one time here that one of the families in my son's school, Cooper, you probably remember this, where the family kind of went homeless overnight. Like it was a very big tragedy, but he and some other kids from the street um, did a lemonade stand to help that family. And I just love that when, you know, the lemonade stands are something that kids like to do anyway. Right. And so if you can do something really wonderful with the money to help somebody else, I think that's really great. Anyone else have anything they want to share about something they've enjoyed or something that's inspired them? You know, it could be an ICANN thing. Some of you all have been to the ICANN conference. Uh, you participate in these monthly meetings. Maybe there's something here that you thought was really cool or inspiring. And don't be shy. I know it's early on a Saturday for some of you. <laughs> well, I'll talk. Oh, go ahead, Amy. I was just going to say, um, Pooja Sai, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and share a little bit about your idea. This can also be things that maybe you're thinking about doing, you know, maybe it hasn't been completed yet. Um, but there are things that you're kind of mulling around because at Ask the Experts, we can also help to inspire you and provide ways to make your ideas a reality. Um, so if you wanted to jump on and just kind of share that you know, you you see a need for something, you know, that, that's great too. We can also kind of explore that idea. Um, so I kind of like, like very recently, like started a blog and I like um, cover like different topics about um, mental health. And it, it's just like, I just use like information on like, like Google and something and just like, you know, write my like opinions on it and like use like you know, scientists and res researchers, like, thoughts and stuff, but, like, I really wanted, like, to share, like, young people's voice on, like, this blog, but, like, I didn't really know how to, so I emailed Amy, and she said that, you know, you could just, like, go around the hospitals and, you know, ask if, hey, is there, like, anyone who's, like, willing to share a voice, because I really like to, like, provide stories on, like, a personal level, and like, I don't have that. So it'd be really cool to do that. I love that. And we love that you're doing this with ICANN. And we want to, you know, we want all the kids of ICANN to know that they can reach out to us anytime. And if they have ideas like that, we're happy to talk through them and help them figure out how to take something forward um, or share what they're doing and what they love. So we're so happy you're doing that. I was going to share a story about something that inspired me. Um, many years ago now, probably, oh, like 25 years ago, I was driving to work one day and I was listening to comments about how people who are deaf and hard of hearing were suing the movie systems, movie theaters, because they wanted captions at the movies, um, to, you know, help them enjoy the movies. And I thought, well, I'm an optical engineer I should be able to figure out a way to get these people captions at a movie theater where it's not just on the big screen, um, because that was always the fight is that people who don't need captions don't necessarily want captions on the screen, um, but people who need them really do. And so could there be something that I could do otherwise? And I came up with a system that um, 
could provide captions just to the person who needed them. And I actually started a company around it and sold it to some pretty big places um, like the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. And that was also really fun because I got to go there opening night, first Monday night football at Dallas Cowboys Stadium many years ago now. Um, but it was, you know, it was really great to know that you can create something that helps somebody else. And that was really fun for me. And that kind of kicked off, you know, led me down the path to where I am today, looking at assistive technologies, devices that can help um, people with their daily lives and then into healthcare and wearable sensors and now to help everyone here and inspire other kids through ICANN. So that was really fun for me. And again, I was just listening to the radio one day and that's what struck me. So I think you can kind of get inspiration from anywhere. And I see a lot going on in the chat. Um, what do we have going on, Amy? Amy? Well, you know what? We're getting some really great feedback right now. So everybody loves that, Leanne. I just think that's incredible. And it really is a spark for the kids. They want to hear more about those kinds of things, I believe. Yeah. I, you know, I can tell about another thing. Um, and some of you all know this, and Anthony knows this for sure. But as my role at Georgia Tech, my whole position is kind of helping figure out that inspiration and, and figuring out how to make something happen that um, can help change the lives of people. And so my title at work is Chief Engineer of Pediatric Technology. And what that means is I go around and I talk to doctors and nurses and say, hey, you know, what are some things that you could use to help make it easier to take care of all the kids at your hospital? And doctors and nurses have great ideas, um, but sometimes they just have a problem. They're like, if I could just solve X, you know, it would make healthcare better for so many people. And so one day I was going around and I was asking a lot of doctors and nurses if they could change one thing, what could it be? And many of them said, we would like to um, reduce or detect something called IV infiltration. And so if you get an IV in your hand or somewhere else on your body, some of you all have probably had that in, in your experiences. Um, sometimes that blood vessel can burst or the needle misses or you know pops through it eventually. And so the medicine isn't getting where it needs to go, but the medicine that leaks out into your skin, not going into your vein can also be really harmful and cause permanent damage like scarring and it can you know eat away at the tissue, like all sorts of really terrible things. But if you can detect it within 30 minutes, um, the nurses told us, then you can avoid all the really bad things that happen. Um, because right now the nurses just go around and look for it, but they don't necessarily have time to stop at every kid every 30 minutes to um, check and make sure that everything is okay. And so I was like, well, I build sensors, sensor technology. I think I should be able to figure this out. So I put a team together at Georgia Tech and we've now come up with a sensor system that can sit around the IV site. And um, we were so excited when we took um data we did like a little little miniature clinical trial to see how it would work and um we were able to detect it we're now at 120 minutes before the nurse detects it so it's really remarkable and the nurse was finding it within her 30 minute window which she considered 30 minutes and so we're detecting it so much earlier and we can now send that that um signal out to say, hey, come check this IV, there's a problem. And so that's the piece of the puzzle that we're solving right now as to how to work with the hospital system to get that alert out to the nurses. Um, but we know our detection technology works. And so that's super exciting. But again, that just happened from a conversation, right? So I think sometimes just listening is the best way to go to kind of get inspiration. That is such a good point too. And really a good segue into this next story, because I think you know, the nice thing about having Ask the Experts through ICANN is that you get to connect with people who have other ideas or maybe have a problem and need to have it solved. Um, and that's a wonderful thing for all of us. Going back a few years, um, I have two daughters, Reese, who's on here, and Olivia, who's actually at golf right now for her school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and both of them had uh, been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes years and years before that. Uh, this moment that I'm about to describe, but they, one of the things that they had been frustrated with is having to tell me all the daily ins and outs of what they were feeling or their care needs. 
And so they helped to create diabetes emoticons. And that came from listening. It came from a doctor who reached out and said, how can I make it better for you? What could we do to make this easier? And Reese and Olivia said, well, we really don't want to text our mom all the time. Is there an easier way we can do this so it takes less time? And after they brainstormed a little bit, they came up with this idea to send these pictures back and forth that showed exactly the task that needed to be done. So it saved them a lot of time in sending messages to mom, but it was able to happen so quickly. And I think it, from my perspective, really opened up their communication and lessened the burden of having a diagnosis and made it a little bit easier for everyone. And then those were picked up by families all over the world who were able to freely use them and make that, you know, something that helped them in every way possible. So Reese, I don't know if you want to add to anything. Yeah, I think you summed it up pretty well. Um, but the cool thing about it was it was very uh, regular emojis on your phone, except they were all diabetes related. And so in typing out, mom, I'm testing my blood sugar right now. My blood sugar is whatever. Just send a little picture of like a, a meter testing a blood sugar, understand what was happening. Um, and then same thing with um, like bolusing too blood sugar I could just send a little water drop over full of insulin and she got her on through that too so it's something that sounds minor but it had a massive effect on communication and I think that strengthened our relationship too we were able to communicate a lot more frequently about what was going on so it's little things like that and I think patients that's why it's so important is you can really get into the nitty-gritty of what's going on lives and what could really improve their health care as well as, I don't know, their relationship with loved ones too, is what it ended up being, which is pretty impressive. I love that. I th I've always thought that that was so clever. And I love that you all came up with it. And now it's like an app out there that people can actually use. And I think that's so great. I mean, and it's such a little thing, like you said, right? Like just to help with communication, make it a little bit faster, a little bit easier but it really made an improvement in how you communicated. And I think that's wonderful. Um, I know some people, I know Cooper, I might have to call him out. He's probably cringing in his room right now. Um, there was a kid at their school, you know, just kind of thinking about little things that you can do and what kind of difference you can make. But there was a kid at his school who got diagnosed with cancer. And I know that his school kind of rallied around to to raise money and awareness. Um, and so I don't know, Cooper, if you want to add anything to that um experience but that was just some kids at the school getting together to say you know we want to we want to do better and to help kids like her her and kids like her you know pull through this and so I don't know Coop there you go yeah I mean I don't really know what to add you kind of just summed it all up but basically a girl going into her freshman year got diagnosed with cancer and she had an older sister who was a current senior at the school and they decided to create a company, I believe it was called Team FIA. And what they did was they raised money by selling like sweatshirts and shirts. And I think I believe they did other things as well. I wasn't too actively involved in the group, but I did buy one of their sweatshirts. Um, and it was just all to like raise funding for like research and just for treatment in general, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And I see more going on in the chat. I think the stories illustrate a couple of take home messages. One is um, never underestimate the impact. So I guess that's an I word impact of a younger person. As a matter of fact, a younger person has more leverage sometimes than grown ups in getting funding or getting something started um, because um, grown ups go out of their way to support a younger person, but may not give a grown up the time of day so so uh impact wise for younger people could be pretty substantial it's very hard for grown ups to say no to to younger people that have a have a, a passion for something um i think the other take home message is it's um i'm in california so we're really big on design thinking so which means that if you don't know what that is it's 
basically go into the problem first rather than be distracted by technology trying to find a use for some for uh, in in the healthcare. So it's good to go to uh, the patients, especially younger patients, because they have uh, basically a lot of um, imagination about how what the problems are, but more importantly, how to solve the problems. So um, we, I think we under leverage the patients themselves and the families themselves often. And people who don't have the disease often are the ones that are trying to design solutions to problems that they perceive as important, but they could be totally off target. So um, it's also good to um, leverage the younger generation's imagination because they haven't failed too, too many times in their lives. So they're not afraid to come up with the big, bold ideas for solutions that perhaps grownups don't have any longer because they're so afraid of failure. And I think, um, you know, a great story is um, uh, my nieces um, came uh, one summer and um, wanted to learn how to surf. And um, my brother didn't want to take them surfing. Um, he was a, a little bit afraid of the water. So he said, um, um, well, that's what uncles are for, is to do things that the fathers don't want to do. <laughs> so, so I was like the backup <laughs> for grown up. So I took them surfing and I know, realized that, um, that they, were, they learned how to surf within a couple of hours, whereas grown, a typical grown up would take days, if not weeks, to learn how to get on the board. And it's because they're not afraid to fail. They're not afraid to get on the board and fall off. Just like with skiing also, the, the, the younger you are, the less you're going to be afraid because you don't, you haven't realized that you could fail. And also uh, failing is not a big deal. You know, you just get up, literally get back on the board and do it over again. There's so many opportunities. Now, the, the, the funny ending to that story is um, the next day we were out sailing in the same area. And about a half a dozen, uh, we saw half a dozen um, uh, lemon sharks in that area just swimming around. So then they became, they became grownups. Now they're afraid of the, the water because they saw sharks. Um, so I um, guess the moral to the story is uh, don't um, leverage your lack of um, uh, experience with failure to your advantage and not be afraid to fail. Yeah, I'll say that's one thing that we, you know, always try to do in, in research is, I mean, there's lots and lots of ideas out there, and maybe only a few make it all the way to becoming a, you know, full blown device. But um, if you didn't try out some things along the way, it wouldn't have led you to where you are, right? Like, you kind of have to have those failures to, to get to the right solution in the end. Um, so yeah, definitely don't be afraid to fail. But the other thing that I think kids have that adults don't anymore is that just our world experiences, you kind of get narrower views about things and you learn things and there's preconceived notions. And, um, when you're a kid, you maybe don't have all of that. And so you're much freer to really think outside the box and think of new and creative things because you haven't had a world already shape you with um, too much education and too many experiences and, and things like that. So I think you're a little bit more creative when you're younger sometimes too. All right. So Amy, what's going on in the chat or Claire? <laughs> yeah, so I can hop on. Um, I think Claire, where she's at might have a little background noise. So I'm going to oh, okay. help take over for that piece. Um, we've gotten a lot of positivity. I see that um, Ed mentioned some of the sessions that he liked. Um, and one of the sessions was the session about diabetes. And so um, the comment shared back was, you know, that was a really creative session. And I think that's an interesting concept too, where when we have participatory discussion that often will bring out new ideas and, hey, maybe I could do this or I could do that or we could change it to this. Um, so we love things like that. I think you know, I would love to hear from some of the young people and talk a little bit more about that area, if you'd like to unmute and share. Don't be shy. I know everybody on here. <laughs> we are so happy to have all of you. Um, 
And then another thing that was shared, uh, Valeria had talked about the comfort zone in speaking. Um, and she said, because in her speaking, it left the thought to go over and make experiences that maybe can leave you with good or bad memories or new friends. And so I think that's another really important thing, you know, just thinking about how we make an impact and and creating a culture, I think, within ICANN of shared experiences and empathy and understanding and learning from one another. They're all so important. Yeah, they definitely are. And I, I think that with all of you out there, someone has had to have an experience where they thought, this isn't done right, or this is what I would like to change. And I think sometimes that's, again, what, what inspires. And so if you have ideas, I mean, maybe you don't even have an idea of how you can fix it. Maybe you just say, you know, I had this experience and it wasn't good and there's got to be a better way. Um, I think those things can be very inspiring. So has anyone had any experiences like that? Yeah, I kind of another volunteer one, um, but I, if you can't tell by everything I am, um, I was the president of all the different clubs, <laughs> all the volunteer clubs at high school. Um, and so one of them was our student government. And so we try to do a lot of like new and get student participation up. And it was all based around the students. Um, did notice um, as a part of Key Club, which was another volunteer club I was a part of, there was a lot of food waste at, during lunchtime and kids would just toss whatever they had. Um, and this could be like from their individual lunches or from the provided. And I thought, well, there's a bunch of kids at the school that also don't have food and don't have it to having great lunches every day. And so I set up a little pantry at and I invited everyone to drop off any of the leftovers they had, just put it right on the And kids that didn't have anything for lunch could go right over and grab whatever they wanted right off. So I feel like that was like another thing where I can see the problem and there's an easy solution. And they're, they're just missing that gap piece. So I, um, I set that up and which I feel like that's my legacy for the school, which is pretty cool too. I love that. I think that's very clever. That reminds me of um, of um, a situation that I faced uh, about 30, 35 years ago. <clears throat> I realized that um, a lot of my patients, um, heart patients, um, were not in a position to have a holiday because they didn't have enough funding for a dinner or the children didn't have enough money for books or clothes or toys. So um, um, my sister who was alive at the time and I said, that's not right. We need to correct that wrong and started something called Holiday Hearts. And we got donations for toys and money for groceries for the families and also donations for books and and clothes and um, we wanted didn't want used toys and clothes, but we got money or donations for new ones. And before you knew it, um, you know, the lesson there is that sometimes it's really hard to get something like that going. But it's almost like at some point everything just kind of opens up. Um, and once people found out about it. Um, they were writing checks and um, I was very moved, especially around holiday time. We don't leverage the holiday time enough that people become uh, more generous around that time because they do see that um, the world needs help around that time, even more so than other times. So we were able to give every kid that got registered in the party um, a new book, um, some new clothes, um, a toy, a brand new toy, and the family got uh, groceries or, or money for groceries. And then they also came to this, I mean, it's literally a party, an all day party where we had Santa Claus as the highlight of the day, but we also realized there are many different <laughs> holidays. So, um, but it's an overall holiday celebration. Now, the cool thing about that story is, um, we, well, one time someone even 
was driving by and noticed that we were loading up a, a truck with books and toys and wanted to know what that was about. And literally on the spot, he he um, uh, he was a neighbor and he wrote a check for a thousand dollars. So people are we we sometimes just need to get the word out. And people are there are a lot of good people you know in this world. And then eventually, um, someone that worked for a company. Um, um, locally found out about it and decided that that was going to be their company project uh, as a charity. So they basically took it over. And um, instead of like 100 families, which was our goal every year to help, it got to be a few thousand families um, um, every year. And so the upside and downside of that is the upside is now you can impact on a lot more families than you ever did before. The small downside is you kind of lose that grassroots feeling of being really intimately involved with a charity or, or the, you know, before we knew every family that came and kept in touch throughout the year, we have thousands of families now, it's impossible. So there's a, you have to consider the upside and downside of letting go of a successful charity is when corporations take it over, you do lose that personal, you know, more intimate um, relationship with the charity. So we gave we gave it to the corporation because so many more families were impacted. It was not about us; it's about them. Um, so you have to be not so selfish. <laughs> you know, thinking about that, um, one of my friend's kids happened to have to be in the hospital for like three or four days. So it wasn't terribly long, but it happened to be right around Christmas. And he just thought that, you know, Christmas wasn't, the hospital wasn't necessarily the best place to stay at Christmas. And he kind of felt like he was missing a little bit of the, the fun he normally had with his families at Christmas. And um, so he started a charity and the first few years, it was literally like um, asking friends of his parents to donate some toys so he could take them to some kids at the hospital and now it's been about seven or eight years and he's still only like 13 or 14 years old he's still very young he started this when he was super young and um now they're bringing in I think last year they brought in over 2,000 toys to give to the local children's hospital and I thought that that was just really wonderful and that just stemmed from you know just a few days he was there and he thought it could be better and like Anthony said, a little bit of grassroots, asking your parents, friends to donate a few toys, taking in 10 or 12 to being able to share it now broadly um, all over Facebook, you know, for anyone who's they're friends with on Facebook and they give an Amazon link and they just go in, you can just go in and buy toys um, on Amazon, things on Amazon and, and send it to them. Um, and so I think that's really amazing and inspiring too, that, you know, again, just some little ideas, some little experiences can turn into something a lot bigger and better. Sometimes a little um, imagination to have something that's more relatable for people uh, really helps. Uh, One of the smartest things that I remember when I was at Boston Children's Hospital, um, they had a really big uh, tree, Christmas tree, with lots of ornaments with kids' names on it. And I didn't know what that was about. I thought the kids made them or something. But it was basically for people to take the ornament home with a child's name on it and donate to that child uh, at the hospital so that they can have their um, holiday. So it's so relatable and so easy to do and so compelling as a way to convince you to donate, you know? And so some, sometimes, um, I think we under leverage stories of situations that people can relate to, to um, to give them the incentive to donate. Um, and I think it's one thing to say, well, donate to this charity, but tell a story, T- tell a story of a child and a family to make it really, really con- convincing. And also many stories because people may want to sort of, um, you know, adopt that family uh, or child to to help because they can relate to that person now yeah I, you know I they call them angel trees or they do here and I love it because um you know it's written by a kid like what they could use or it's written by a parent what what they could use and you get things like you know clothing sizes and if 
you know, they wanted a toy or something like what would make them really happy to receive. And so it really, you know, when you do that, you know, you're helping a kid directly. And I think that that's, you know, part of the storytelling that Anthony was saying is that, you know, you can give money to a charity and it kind of goes into a black hole sometimes and you wonder what actually happened with it. But if you can buy something for this kid that exists who asked for this one thing, um, it, it feels really good to, to help kids like that a little bit more directly. You know, that is so great. And, and I think we all sometimes get overwhelmed by the idea of how much money does it take to donate or do something, but it can be a really small donation too. Um, and something that's kind of fun that we've done for years at our local children's hospital is to do a wacky sock drive. Um, and this was started through another adventure <laughs> with Reese's high school um, in which she had learned from child life that patients who are coming in often after a tragedy, maybe a bad car accident or something just unpredicted and unplanned came in with nothing. So, you know, the socks that they might have been wearing, they couldn't wear any longer because they were dirty or, you know, something had happened in the transport of that patient to the hospital. But they're kids, right? So the socks that they were all getting as part of being an inpatient were big, giant, ugly adult socks that had the stickies on the bottom and they didn't feel really good to put on and they didn't look really pretty to look at or even fun or kid friendly. And sometimes they didn't even fit the youngest patients. So the high school decided what they were going to do was to do a wacky sock drive. And if you've ever been out shopping, you've probably seen fun, crazy looking socks and how silly and goofy those are. Um, and they might have appealed to you as a young person and you might have thought, hey, I would love to have these socks. Well, so did the patients. And so now they do a, a big drive every year. It's an annual event where they get thousands and thousands of socks donated into the hospital and then the nurses get to distribute them. So they go down to the, the closet that holds all the socks and they pick out the special socks they wanna to give to those patients that week on their floor. And they're usually tied to a patient's interest. Maybe somebody likes dogs or somebody likes, um, you know, giant rainbows or somebody wants pizza slices, you know, whatever that thing is. And the nurses get to be the heroes and pass them out and make their patients feel better. But everybody contributes to that. So you supporting the nurses and being able to provide that smile back to the patients is really a great thing. And that's something everybody can do. It only takes maybe a dollar or two to buy a pair of socks. They're not very expensive and it's got a great big reward. So as you're thinking about things, oh, Reese, go ahead. My favorite part about that story is this was the first year we were doing it and I wasn't really sure if we were gonna get many socks or if we got the word out enough, but. We really pushed it online and I made a bunch of posters in the schools and everything. And the first year we had a whole week dedicated to the sock drive. And so kids could just drop them off in their first hour. And so I went through and I collected all of them and I realized that we had a lot more socks than I was anticipating. And so I remember I had a cart them all home. <laughs> we put them all in our living room. And at some point there were just boxes and boxes and towers of socks. <laughs> I was like, holy cow, people were really excited about this <laughs> wacky sock drive. So that's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, that's a little bit um, for those who went to the ICANN conference and you got fun socks in your bag. Um, it was a little bit inspired from the wacky sock drive that Amy had told me about. And we worked with um, a company who does fun socks and they divvy up as their name. And, and so they donated a bunch of fun socks to our ICANN kids. Um, but I was inspired by the, the wacky stock sock drive that Reese had done. Sometimes um, there's a corporation that has similar sort of, um, uh, a mission. So I know Bumba Socks actually literally donate a pair of socks for every sock, pair of socks they sell. So that's where uh, a young person can be particularly effective to communicate with that corporation and see if you can form a partnership. Again, you're, you're giving up your own charity in a way to a corporation, but that's a very powerful alliance that you can form that will impact on so many more people. And um, you just have to, it's a personal decision whether or not you're willing to have a corporation help you, but the impact is just so several magnitudes more than you can do on your own. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love that. And that kind of goes back to spreading the word and, and storytelling. You know, I think if you share the, the things that you learn as a young person, like, oh, this company supports more kids by giving away socks for every pair you buy. Yeah. Maybe other classmates didn't know that. So when they're making a choice between sock A and sock B, you know, what's the one that does more for the community? What's, yeah. you know, the better alternative? So I love things like that. And I think that's a really important thing, too. Yeah, never underestimate the power of a young person. It's almost like the younger you are, the more power you have. Um, my, uh, just to give you a, a recent example, my eight-year-old daughter wants to be an engineer and wants to be in an engineer with NASA. So she thinks that kids should help, um, that NASA should help kids to have an interest in, in the um, sciences. So very innocently, she said, well, I can just write to NASA, like to let them know that kids need to help and NASA needs to help kids, sort of a partnership. And so she wrote a letter with, with quite a few misspelled words, but um, wrote a letter to NASA to the, she said, um, I, th I think uh, one of my tutors helped her during the day and actually found the director of NASA and actually addressed the letter to the director of NASA. Now, if you're the director of NASA, you get lots of letters that are kind of boring. But a handwritten letter from a kid that wants to generate interest uh, for NASA with kids uh, is going to be very, probably the most interesting letter that you'll get that week. And I said, you know, it's it's kind of cute because every day we, I go pick up the mail with them and then they're like, is the NASA right back? You know, well, the NASA hasn't written back, but... Um, but that kind of naivete and also enthusiasm is so contagious, you know, and I said, I think it's 50-50 that they'll write you back, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they wrote a nice letter back and maybe you could start something, you know, like Kids for NASA, whatever it is. And, you know, her dream is to go to NASA as an engineer and, you know, you never know, right? You never underestimate an eight-year-old and what they can do on their way to, you know, fulfilling their their dream so um I, I told her that you know that that one letter can be the sort of the clarion call for a lot of young people to get in, involved in space at a time that and the timing is good there is a renewed interest in space right so yeah. you never know I love that I yeah kids writing letters it's awesome and I hope that NASA does write back um and you said it might be the most interesting letter of the week. My guess is it's probably the most in interesting letter of the year. Um, I, I love that. So <clears throat> yeah, and that's just, you know, writing a letter, like it's a simple thing to do, but I think if they got, you know, a hundred letters from kids saying you need to do something like this, um, I, I just think that there's a lot of power behind what what one voice can do. And if you can rally other voices to do the same, um, what kind of impact you can make. And I see much more she going also, on in by the, the way, Lynn, I just want to add, she also thinks there are way too many boy astronauts. I agree with her. <laughs> that there needs to be more girl astronauts. And I, I said, I think they're called women astronauts, but not, <laughs> that's, well, girls can go to space. I say, well, you're right, technically, you know. So she thinks that timing wise, she may be one of the first girls to go to Mars. That would be awesome. Oh. Is, is she over there? <laughs> Hi. Anthony, you're on mute. She really does look like an engineer with her glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say, play the, play the glasses card, you know, when you talk to people. That's right. <laughs> this one just wants to be a doctor um, just a doctor <laughs> I love it I love it too hi doesn't she look like a smart engineer <laughs> she does I see those brains inside of there that's good right. uh-huh always thinking mm -hmm. and their pea okay. glasses too it doesn't get much better than that 
exactly. much more much more expensive than the regular colors i have to say five thousand dollars no it's not five thousand dollars five hundred dollars believe it or not but i got another one yeah okay. two for five hundred which was far more expensive than i realized but um so kids are very um you know, inspiring. Next you know, we... Friday, I'm going to get my eye checkup. Okay, that's too much information. <laughs> you know, it's funny. So this is an old-fashioned phrase, but I used to have pink glasses too when I was younger. And everybody used to tease me and say, Amy, you see the world through rose-colored glasses. And now <laughs> I can say that to somebody else. And that just means that you see very good things in life. And so that's a good trait to have too. Absolutely. What do you say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been great, guys. So we have about nine minutes left. And, you know, I think the momentum here has been fantastic today. I'm in so inspired by all of you. And I think, you know, together we can really do some amazing things as part of the ICANN community. The ideas you've shared are just incredible. Um, so we have just a little bit of time left. And I want to also talk about next year. So as I shared to all of you, I wanted to harness your ideas and think about the topics you might want to hear for next year and what that would look like. Um, all ideas are great. And we have Claire who's going to keep record of all of this. So we can uh, go back through our list. We can't guarantee we're going to do all the ideas you share, but we're going to look at them all together. We are asking everybody to submit them. So if there's something you want to talk about and ask the experts, please unmute and go ahead and share your idea. And I'll just say it can be anything from talking to doctors about career paths or what they do every day to um, innovation and building new things to, you know, maybe you just really love art. And we have groups like Jumo Health who have artists who could come on and talk about it, or we could do science experiments. Like there's all sorts of things that we can do. And we just want to hear from you all. What would be the most fun thing to do for you? What would you really like to do? Don't be shy. I know you all have ideas because you attend all the time. Could I speak on that for a second? Yeah. Um, so I think it's always interesting. And I know you like to talk about that a lot, mom, where you you talk about how you didn't really know you were going to go work in healthcare or any of that. And I just think it's interesting to hear a lot of professional stories on what kind of led them there. Because a lot of times it's it's not, I since day one, I wanted to be a doctor. And for some people it is, but a lot of times it's, oh, I did this and this, and then I stumbled down this path and got here. And I always think that's interesting. Um, I don't know how great it would be. Like, I think also like experiments as well would just be really cool to do. But I always, always found it was interesting listening to how people got to where they are now. I love that. And you're right. Some people just stumble into these things like me. <laughs> it all started actually from that, the story I told in the very beginning about doing captions for a movie theater. For me, that kind of got me into the world of, of helping people. And some people thought of it as healthcare and started doing more things in healthcare, which kind of led me to ICANN in the end. Um, so yeah, I'm, I know lots of people have really interesting stories that aren't just, I always wanted to be a doctor and so I was, you know? Um, I think that would be cool, a cool um, topic. I guess we're stuck on I words today. Um, I think a lot of people, especially young people are, um, can be relatively impatient. They want to find their, their perfect, you know, career. And sometimes what I ask them to do is just um, not be so impatient. Let let your career come to you naturally. It's almost like when you force it uh, or you get into something that's too early, you're going to end up not being happy. And sometimes it's good to just, you know, not put pressure on yourself to decide and let the career come to you. Uh, and that was totally the uh, situation that was totally uh, my case. You know, I had, was determined to be an architect and probably a little bit too early in my career, around 14, 15. And then I heard one talk by a pediatric cardiologist at the NIH heart seminar series because I was doing well in biology. So it was totally an area that I <laughs> had not known about and wasn't even aware of. And 
it, that one hour talk by this pediatric cardiologist changed my life. And it kind of came to me. I didn't chase it. You know, I didn't say I want to be a doctor. I actually want to be an architect. So um, you never know. Something can come to you and could be very, very dramatic even and to change your direction. So, but you have to be open-minded enough to be exposed to these areas. And I, I wasn't, I almost lost the opportunity to go to the NIH because I was convinced I wasn't going to be a doctor actually. So, <laughs> um, but you never know. Some people, um, my biology, my biology teacher saw something in me that wanted to give me that opportunity and sent me to the NIH and she was totally right. Um, so sometimes as a young person, you can be a little stubborn to know that you know what's good for you when you should probably be listening to people at the same time. Yeah, I think that would be a really cool topic to have one time is to, you know, have some of our friends who are doctors or who work in the healthcare industry talk about how they got to where to where they are. So I think that's a really cool idea, Coop. And experiments too, they're fun. I like that suggestion as well. Anyone else have any ideas? Come on now. I know you all have ideas about what you'd like to talk about on a Saturday morning. I mean, and it's maybe some of the things that we've done before, right? Like you just thought that this was a really cool session. Let's do something like that again. Um, but we want to make this what, what you all want it to be. So um, definitely give us ideas. And if you can't think of anything right now, email Amy later, or Claire or me, and um, we'll help make it happen. Mom, the TED Talk idea sounds really cool, too. I would love to know more about what goes into that and how you create one. And that goes back to sharing your story, too, which is such an important skill, especially for ICANN as well. Oh, yeah. That's a great idea, Reese. I'm sure we know people who have done TED Talks before who could talk about the experience. And I think that would be really cool. I would love to hear that, actually. That would be great. It's also cool because they talk about so many different things as well, but they're, they always have some type of positive um, take back or I like that too. They're always positive conclusions. So, yep. I mean, that's just one more way to help share your idea with the larger audience um, to have a bigger impact too. The other idea that I, I've heard a few of you talk about, but I don't know where you are, if you want to do this or not, um, but resume building or LinkedIn page building, things like that, um, just as you start to share your ideas, we want to make sure you're reaching to the audiences you want to reach. You know, not everybody wants to do this as they grow up, but some people want to share these experiences and the things they've been involved in. Is that something you're maybe interested in learning more about? I am. I would love to know more about that. I am. I would love to know more about that. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. That's fantastic. Um, there's so many ideas in the chat too. You guys have been great. We are capturing all of these. Um, so we're going to go ahead and make sure that, you know, they go into our, our spreadsheet. We have a nice, big, comprehensive spreadsheet. Um, but these are just wonderful, wonderful ideas. I love everything you're sharing. And I want to say that for some of you, if I can has be has been an inspiration for you and you all are, you know, participating in a lot of things. I think this is true. If you want to have an, a lemonade stand to help I can, or if you come up with an idea about, you know, helping more kids in your school, learn about I can and bringing them in to be a part of it. Um, we would absolutely love that and would help you any way we could if, if that's something that inspires you to, to want to do. And I think we're about at the end of time. I don't know if anyone has any kind of last comments, but again, you know, get ideas going in your head and, and reach out to me and Amy and Claire and, and we can help talk through things and help you maybe formulate a plan to take something forward or, or give you the platform through ICANN to take something forward and get the word out. Um, we're happy to. And I'm going to throw a plug out there. Um, Pooja Sai has her blog started and she is looking for stories. So if you would like to share any of your personal stories with her to share on her blog for mental health awareness, um, feel free to do so. I think she would probably enjoy that. And Pooja Sai, do, is there anything you want to add as you're going forward on your project? 
Probably if anyone just has like any stories or like any thoughts that maybe is like, you know, related to mental health awareness, I just like really like to like, you know, communicate with you and like research on it a little more and like probably write about it too. And I think too, um, you know, if you share your story with her to be a part of this blog, she doesn't necessarily have to share your name with it. Um, if you didn't want to be recognized for talking about something in the mental health space, but um, if you do, that's wonderful too. And I, I bet a lot of kids could really contribute to, to what, you know, helps them feel better about mental health or things that, you know, worry them or whatever it is. I think that there's a lot that can be done in this topic. I think it's a really important topic that maybe doesn't get discussed enough. Um, And so I think if you, if you or someone you know might want to share their story, I think that would be great. And I, we are at the top of the hour. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. And thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. So that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. (laughs) All right.